Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest in a series of interviews here. And this one, I'm excited to say, is a little bit different because we are talking adaptation, rather ambitious crowdfunded adaptations, because it is my joy to bring you both Will White and Jay Olivier, who, uh, did I say both those correct? It's Oliva, but Oliva. it's okay. Sorry, I gave you a little Olivier extra sound, flair. Yeah, Olivier <laughs> sounds so fancy, so maybe I'll change it to that. Yeah, it's like Sir Lawrence. Yes. I, I did have a habit of calling you Will Wicked on my channel for a while, but I, I, heard, was, I heard that. Uh, yeah. people, people kept telling me that in comments about you. Is this that he keeps <laughs> calling you Will Wicked? I'm like, yeah, I understand. That's a logical way to think this is pronounced. It's more just I tried for a while to give every author a nickname and I got such strong pushback on it. I was like, I'm, I'm stopping. I will call Brandon Sanderson, Bieber Bop, Biggity Bingle, and that's fine. But anyone else okay. cannot that's get fine. a nickname, apparently. Although, although Will Wick sounds like a cool uh, John Wick spinoff. So, but it's, it's, it's Will going off and he's assassinating people with his books. <laughs> if Keanu Reeves is listening, like, I'm in for that. Like, I'm, I'm down. I've been hit by a surprising number of books. They hurt. They are effective weapons. They are. They're heavy heavier than you think. Speaking of effective weapons transition, uh, you guys have very excitingly just launched your Kickstarter for the attempt to adapt Cradle to an animation format. And the first question that immediately jumped to my mind was how did this project get started? How did Jay and Will cross paths and then the ambition decide to take Cradle to the small screen? Yeah, it was actually, it was pretty crazy because I got an email from Jay and uh, and it was his actually from his his agent and emailed us saying that Jay was really interested in adapting Cradle and I thought that was super cool because I knew who Jay was because I'd watched a lot of the DC animated movies so I love all this all this DC animated stuff I love Batman and I so I was really excited and then couldn't wait to talk to Jay and as soon as we did, he started introducing himself on the, he, he has the, he has this like whole spiel of who he is. And I was going, Jay, I gotta stop you, man. I already know exactly who you are. And so, yeah, so Jay, you, can you talk about uh, how you got to know the books? Uh, yeah, so um, I started my own animation studio, geez, about five years ago. Um, so, which is a nice thing about that is that I get to work, pick the projects that I wanna work on. So um, I was working with uh, one of my, my writers and uh, he had mentioned, hey, have you read the Cradle series? And again, I had no idea what that was. Uh, I looked into it, I found it on Audible because uh, I love Audible and I don't have time to read physical books nowadays. Um, so I, I listened to the first, uh, I think I got about two and a half into the third book. Um, and I was like, I have to, I have to find out who has the rights for this. And so I asked my <laughs> my manager, hey, can you find out who has the rights for this? And that's when we we shot the email out to, to Will. And so had you had any experience with progression fantasy before this? Was it something that you knew of or did Cradle I, start you down that path? Uh, no, I mean, in fact, uh, it wasn't until I was talking to Will that I actually even knew there was a term for progression fantasy. I, I guess like, I, I always love the whole zero to hero kind of storylines that you see prevalent in a lot of movies and, and book series uh, today. I just never knew there was a, a name for it and I didn't know there was a whole genre of it. So uh, I always just love telling the stories. I love the, the story of Lyndon and and uh, I've, I've mentioned this to Will many times that it wasn't until the, the scene where Serial shows up that I just lost my mind. And I was like, w wait a minute. And I thought to myself, oh, this is gonna be a good scene. And like, I already shot it in my head. I directed it and I had scored it with music and it was glorious. And so I, you know, I, I was super excited about, you know, uh, with the chance to, to collaborate with Will and his team to, to bring this to, uh, uh, to, the, to the small screen. Yeah, so we were talking with uh, with Jay and with his team at Lex and Otis, and we were talking with them for a long time, over a year, two, two years. It was it was a while, and we yeah. were we were talking about how to adapt Cradle and then pitch it to a studio or the streaming service or somebody just somebody who could who could fund it and make it a reality. And as we were developing it, we were kind of going, okay, let, we, we were talking about how to develop this project, but let's try and make an actual uh, project happen let's let's really animate something let's work together let's do a project and for, since i began writing we i've been setting aside money we've been saving money in the company to do a big project like this now we didn't know what that was we were just going let's let's save as much book money as we can so that one day when we run into an opportunity uh for something to make we can actually fund it 
So we went to them and we said, okay, hey, what about if we did kind of an original, uh, and we talked a little bit about what this could be, but an original trailer style short film that we're now calling a sizzle reel. And so we paid for, we decided, okay, we're gonna do that. So we, we decided to fund it. We've been, uh, uh, I was working on the outline. I went back and forth with Jay's team on that. He was talking about what he wanted to see in it. And we've been working on developing that for a few months now, and that's currently in production. And while we were doing that, we went, okay, this is gonna be a great tool to maybe get some companies interested in the, the show. But as we were doing this, we went, wait a minute, it's not really companies we wanna get interested in the show, it's really the fans. We want to do this together, not just with each other, but with the fans. And we thought we and you know we'd, we'd run these Kickstarters for special editions for Cradle before, and so we were going. We definitely have a really passionate fan base, and we've got people who are willing to go to Kickstarter and back some stuff. And we thought, hey, let's go to the fans and see if they're willing to maybe fund an adaptation of this. And so that was sort of how we went from talking about it to making our own little sizzle reel, which again is still in production, and that's going to be made. That's separate from the Kickstarter. That's that's going and into let's maybe kickstart whatever we can make let's let's kickstart it and let's see where we go from there that's really interesting and so there's always this sentiment among fans where you know you want the original writer involved in an adaptation mm. seems like the golden opportunity is here where you are someone who's working with like an animator you're familiar with and you know jay you're able to work directly with a creative mind who's behind it that being said, though, is there a level of work that's kind of been surprising to you, Will? And Jay, has, has Will been rolling with the punches pretty well of the adaptation process? Uh, you know, I have to say this. Will and his team have been a dream to work with. Uh, normally, uh, you usually get a lot of notes and it's very nitpicky, uh, which is, again, a reason why doing it this way through Kickstarter was a way to kind of do something that's more 100% of what the original creator had thought about because again I've been working on a lot of you know projects over the years and I've noticed that in more recent memory uh, studios have gotten their hands into projects and started changing things I'd like you know because I mean get it I, mean, I get it you know uh, streamer is is forking up most of the the money uh, they want to ensure that you know by their analytics like I got a note one time said hey our our uh, core audience of anime they they only like protagonists who are in their uh, early to mid 20s and I was like okay well, what about older kids they're like no it has to be this and so they made me change uh, you know the, the the age and the whole kind of concept of some of the projects that I'd worked on in the past and so this particular project was one of those things that when Will and I were talking about we thought you know instead of getting studio involvement why don't we just make something for the fans right something that the fans will connect with that when they see they aren't going to think to themselves that oh you know what oh look it's now there's a talking dragon now and no oh, wait actually, there's a talking dragon there's orthos but anyway <laughs> when that stings there we go there's no musical part of it but um but anyway so doing it this way was our way of kind of saying like you know to kind of tell the fans like listen you know um you know, you make a difference, right? And, and we're making this for them, right? And doing it this way allows us to have, you know, 100% control of it. And like I said, Will's been a dream because, you know, I didn't realize that he wrote, he wrote it, in some cases, he wrote something's kind of vague, which I didn't know because in my head, when I when I listened to it or I read it, um, I filled in the blanks, right? And then I'm talking to Will and he's like, oh, I never even wrote that in. And I'm like, really? Because I could swear I, that's how I saw it. So that's the one thing that was great about this this collaboration is that you know I, I throw stuff to Will and he he's really digging kind of the stuff that my team's been doing and uh, and we've been uh, I've been thrilled to kind of bring to life this this world that I've only just seen in my head but also trying to make sure that the world is also what Will sees in his head too and hopefully bring a little bit more color and life to what maybe he had he didn't imagine on some of the the characters and locations. Yeah, it really it, it has been extremely cool to uh, see a team of talented and professional artists like what Jay's got and they're coming out with with art that is just amazing. And the fan art I've gotten over the years has been great too, but it's just, it's a different level to see what some, what a professional produces. And especially when they're, they're putting out backgrounds and they're bringing up all this stuff, a lot of things that I hadn't even thought and details I hadn't filled in. And that's been, that's been extremely cool. One of the things that uh, has surprised me about working on an adaptation is how many questions Jay has that I, do. so he's got these very specific questions like, what holds the bowl up and what about this character how what is this visually how would you represent this process like advancement in the sacred arts 
one of the things he, he was going like, how would you visually represent that? And I didn't had no need to do that in the book because everybody can kind of spiritually sense what's going on. But in an animation, obviously, you gotta you gotta show that in some way. So how do you distinguish? So one of the things that happens later on is you get you have a gold sign that kind of is a magical thing that attaches to you. And how do you visually distinguish that from something that is just that's that's just some on their outfit, right? So I don't know. I would that was something that he's asking me these questions, and so then I've got to figure it out, and then the artists do their interpretation of it, and that's been really interesting. And one of the adjustments I had to make was when I went in, rather than over noting, I wanted to undernote things. I was just like, "Yep, what you did looks great. I, I mean, it looks really good. I'm there." And they really wanted to know. They were very clear about. It. I had to go back at this a couple of times. They really wanted to know how does this compare to what you see? What do you think? Do you have any thoughts? Do you have any suggestions? Do you have any direction? So they were very eager to get at what was in my head. And so it was uncomfortable. I, I didn't want to give them any notes because it looked good. But as I was going, well, I was kind of thinking more this, and then they'll take that and they'll run it in that direction. So that's been fun for me uh, on an adaptation side because I've never done anything like this before. So this this goes into a territory I, I think a lot of fans are very curious about, which is whenever a Kickstarter is announced, you know, there's funding goals, there's stretch goals. Do you mind getting into the nitty gritty of like how all of that was decided and like, you know, where you're, you know, you know, the dream is obviously I think you said your your top goal is like about uh, for the full first book being done is like 6.5. And then you have things beyond that as well. How did those yeah. numbers get decided? Yeah, so that was that was actually, of course, a, a lot of our discussion. And we know, so we put all the stretch goals up there up to, I think our highest was like $15 million. Which we knew we were never going to get, but we put all that stuff up there to show this is what could happen and this is what it would take. And this is to kind of put everything in perspective, right? So one of the first things we did was we went to Lex and Otis, Jay's team, and we were trying to say, okay, what can we get for what budget? So we had to figure out like, uh, you get about 70% of, of whatever you get in the Kickstarter goes to the the actual project, right? That's as high as we can get it. And we were going, okay, so now with, with that, what can you definitely make at these tiers? Because the last thing we wanted to do was say, eh, we can probably hit it at this and then, and then not be able to do it, right? So we had to kind of work backwards in that regard. And then we went, what can you do for these breakpoints? And then we had to decide, okay, what is gonna, what are the fans gonna want? So one of the things we started off with was we started off with an animatic. And one of the hard parts about an animatic is people don't know what an animatic is. And so Jay, can you, uh, we, we decided on that because we can tell a story in an animatic. And if we really did full animation, we'd be getting these shorts. We'd be getting small bits of animation, but you can do a lot of animatic because it's much cheaper. So Jay, can you talk a little bit about what an animatic is and what that's gonna look like if that's what we hit? Uh, so an animatic is basically, it's all of the storyboards put together. Uh, it's timed with music and sound effects and the actors on there. Uh, that also has all the poses in there that we would then usually would send it to an animation team who would then basically um, animate the in-betweens of it. So we would, it would be uh, as close to on model as it can be because it's not quite the animators doing it but we would draw it close to the model so you'd be able to recognize who it is. Um, it wouldn't be in color, right? Uh, it'd normally be black and white with some gray tones. Um, but, you know, I mean, sometimes some animatics look almost fully animated and some are, you know, just basically the shots with the acting, which is basically what we would send to the animators. So in this way, at least we would be able to get the first book out there for the fans to see it visually. You know, we'd still have to, the thing is with, with the, that stretch goal, we would still need to hire designers. We still need to hire background uh, artists. So it wouldn't be like the storyboard artist, which could possibly be me doing the whole thing, or a, me and a team of people, depending on how soon it would take. Because even doing something like a feature length film, which is about 80 minutes, 72 to 80 minutes, uh, that still takes about uh, about three to five months of, of um, production right pre-production because even when i did my um my uh, animated stuff uh, for dc and warner brothers those took about three and a half four months but that was i had a whole team i had like six storyboard artists i was directing it um so this would be a little bit different we take a little bit more time on it mostly because you know we want to get it right and we want to make it look pretty uh, because the end result is the animatic as opposed to just getting it to the point where the animators can take it and then just you know kind of animate off of it and then you, and then the fans would never see the animation uh, and of so course, this would be I, something like that yeah and of course the reason i wanted to hit that is because so many people didn't know what an animatic was 
And the reason why I wanted to, I wanted that as the bottom level goal instead of a, a short film or clips or something else that would be, that would have been at that level is uh, I thought we could tell a lot of the story with this. And I've seen some of the stuff that they've done even at the animatic stage. And I think it looks really good. So that's one where I went, okay, well, how much of the, how much of the story can we get to fans for each break point. And that was kind of how we hit the, the stretch goals. Okay, and so this uh, an animatic is uh, the, the first uh, tier, and there's also, it seems, a new cradle story that uh, is uh, coming along with this Kickstarter as well, a little bit of a cherry on top. Is that something you kind of had in back pocket, or was that created for this Kickstarter? That was the kind of thing where I went, okay, what can we get our fans that they'd be excited about that, that we can actually do? <laughs> and so I went, well, I know what I can do, and I can write stuff. So that's, uh, that's, about, that's about what we got. So for the Cradle short story, I have a lot of ideas. There were a number of uh, scenes that I considered putting in the final book that I never wrote. So I was like, oh, I'll write some of those that'll stand alone and I'll, that'll end up being the story. And then if we go further up, there's one to, there's a tier, for instance, that's an, another Cradle book. So that's something that if we hit that, I, I don't want to do Cradle 13 because that's, you know, that's, that's kind of, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want the series to, to be going on forever. But it's something where I could set some some of it after the end of Cradle and then some of it kind of during Cradle. Basically just fleshing out, giving some fan favorite characters kind of a more of a send off uh, and then showing sort of how some of the main characters ended up after the conclusion of Cradle. And then even maybe doing some prologue, like uh, some stuff that set before. I don't want to give too much. I, if I talk too much about that, I'm going to give it away. But Damn. some fans already know. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I'm, I'm to, sorry. You know, like what kind of stuff before, you know, like it, yeah. two months. Who knows? Couple and so, Jay, you have this background in uh, superhero animation, which is, you know, so combat oriented so often, but also has the drama. And it is not necessarily progression fantasy, but there's so much you can bring over from one to another. And is there a specific vision you have for, let's say, you guys get fully funded for the style you want to take towards the combat, the animation, the character look for Cradle? Can you speak on that vision you spoke about earlier? Um, I mean, if there's one thing that uh, you, maybe people who have noticed uh, when I do a lot of my um, animated films, especially like the Batman stuff, is that um, I like to really bring a lot to the action choreography. So I would say it'd be Cradle, but like John Wick Cradle, where like you would see choreography that would just blow your mind in terms of what you'd see, uh, as well as, you know, uh, throw in the things that you can only do in anime that you can't do in live action, right? Like something that you would see like in One Punch Man or any of the kind of more recent uh, anime animes that's come out where it looks like you're watching like live action choreography. Um, so I would kind of do that. I would kind of, you know, I mean, I worked on um, Legend of Korra. Uh, so I would basically use that as the bar and be like, okay, now how would I do that better? Uh, but also take it take it a step further from in the world that, that Will has created, right? And for me, that's exciting because, you know, I've done a lot of fight choreography. I've done a lot of action stuff, but not in the context that, that Will has done. And, and, and this world is so rich and there's so many different like, you know, styles and, and, and again, when it all comes down to it, it's not really just the 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 fighting. It's the story within the fighting, and I think uh, the stories that Will has set up and and the kind of confrontations, it lends itself to tell a really compelling story within the the framework of an action sequence, right? Uh, I mean, we haven't broken down what it could be to do a whole series, but you know, I'm I'm not against doing uh you know the anime where it's a whole episode of just them fighting right you know like we wouldn't do we wouldn't do like five, 10 episodes of build up and then they would finally fight and then that fight would take over five episodes but we would do it in a way that like we would do and we would have the time to kind of give it the time it needs because you know in in uh, most animated and also in live action in the west they spend the least amount of time usually on the action sequences that you know john wick uh is a little different but most of the time what they do is they spend a lot of time with most of the other scenes and so when it comes to the fight choreography sometimes you'll notice uh, the fighting isn't so great it's because they don't have time to do it you know even on the films that i worked with in the past some of the dc films they they they, they, they did some of those sequences at last because they were running out of money and they're like okay how do we just finish this even though we had grand plans and let's just cut it down to to make it to make it fit and this way though we you know with will's story we would design it to be part of the drama, right? And, and be part of the, the overall tone and feel of the, the show and, and make it fit 
correctly and spend the time for it. And that's that's a big part of uh, how I, was, I wrote the books as well. So I, I wrote the books to try and I didn't want to interrupt the story to just do a fight sequence, even though there's a lot of fight sequences in Cradle. I was trying to make sure that the, the action furthered the story every time. And some of those fights are more successful at that than others. Well, that brings a really good point in where, you know, adaptation with you being directly involved, it kind of seems like it can be a, you know, you've put out so many more books, you can go back to book one and go, oh, I can now tweak. And is there an, a temptation to redo the story to an extent? Or is it, hey, this is what the fans love, leave it as is? How is There's that not a, a temptation. I'm definitely doing that. Okay. <laughs> <So> <laughs> that's, yeah, it's uh, there is there's enough of a temptation that I've already given in. I'm corrupted. I'm done. So to me, the the thing that is the the actual literal uh, sequence of events uh, in the story is not super sacred to me. Um, that this is one of those things where the the analogy I used in an interview with Jay earlier this week was Lord of the Rings is not a super faithful adaptation of the books in terms of literally what happens from, from scene to scene and in what order. But it is in terms of the core story it's telling and the themes and the characters. And that's the sort of, that's the way I feel about the story. I feel like now being able to look back from a long completed series and look back at, at book one, I would, I would plot it differently. For one thing, I was, I was writing Unsold and Soulsmith. So I, I wrote, uh, Soulsmith came out like two months after, uh, after Unsold did. And that's books one and two, by the way, for people at, people at home. Uh, so for books one and two, I wrote the first one and I, I thought it was going to be something that I was writing really quick. It was going to be like my secondary thing uh, to distract people while I was while I was working on a bigger project. And I thought it was something I could write every six months or whatever. And then I re released the first one and it was immediately way more popular than the series I was working on at the time. So I really rushed to get book two out. <laughs> so I was like, okay, great. Uh, so I wrote that in about two months and released it. And then from book three on is really where I went, okay, this is going to be my primary thing. I need to build this out. And I had, I had the world in my head. I had the general plot in my head and all that. I, I had plotted that out as a real series. I just didn't expect it was going to catch on the way it did. So book three is really where I started laying the groundwork for what would then become my big flagship series. So I want to bring that kind of stuff in earlier now, but I know where the series is going. Uh, I know kind of the stuff and there's a lot in Unsold and Soulsmith that uh, I, I would uh, I would trim, I would condense. And then there are elements from book three and further that I would bring in a little earlier just to show that we're going somewhere we're going. And I think I can, if I can streamline that beginning, really, I think the, the first two books and a little bit into book three need condensed. And then there's more later on that need expanded on. And so if we can get through the beginning and we can adapt that, that's where I really can start playing around is, is later on. And Jay, is there any fear from you where you're like, no, 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 we got to keep it as it is. This is what people love. <laughs> well, you know, what's funny is that one of the things that I pitched to Will and his team on that first call was um, let's do a director's cut version of, of, of the whole series, you know, where, you know, at the time, I think the he had 11 books and the, and the last book was about to come out. So I said, you know, by the time this does come out, it's almost like Will doing a retrospective. Like he's looking back over the last seven plus years and and doing, okay, what would he do differently? Now, it's not like we're doing like what Will said when he says like, oh, I'm going to cut some stuff on condensed. I know some of the fans are like, oh, no, wait, everything's sacred. Right. Which for me is like, I want to see everything. Um, but again, like what Will said, you know, when you read The Lord of the Rings, like, it's it's not the way that it, it's in the movies. The way the movies it's edited a little bit better in terms of how one group and it cross cuts, whereas in the books it's just the whole story and then it goes back in time and then it tells another story. And in this way, you know, luckily, you know, Will has written it in such a way that you don't have that problem. But there are some things that I think editorially that Will would probably want to move some scenes around a little bit and some things he might want to kind of elaborate more and others he's like you know what that was that wasn't that important because maybe when i wrote it i was thinking it's going to go somewhere but it didn't really pay off the way i wanted it so maybe that thing can be something that we kind of don't really do so i think this is something that like you know which is great because you never really get a project like this where you have somebody like will coming back to a series that's done and 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 asking himself okay what do i like what i don't like it look at it more objectively mm -hmm. and then doing something that he feels is making this the story stronger right and not changing it to the point where the fans are like 
I have no idea what this like Evangelion. Like every version of Evangelion, yeah, I know, yeah. but it's always so different. And I'm just like, okay, it's still the same kids, and they're all giant robots. But now it's just getting crazier and crazier. I think Will's still gonna stick to the main storyline, but at the same time, like I said, he has the kind of flexibility and the um, kind of foresight to be like, you know what? I know where it's building up to. We can plan that out and make it stronger. Yeah. And so these animatics, let's say you get that done. Is there a plan to then try and shop them around to, you know, get a studio's attention and move from there? Or like, you know, what is it doesn't feel like the Kickstarter is the final step here, right? Cradle's got a lot of potential and there's uh, so much that can be done with each step of this Kickstarter, depending on where it ends up landing. Is there a strategy after, you know, 18 days or 10 days from the time this interview goes live um, where the next foot is going to fall or, you know, how or is it just, hey, we're focusing on the kickstarter don't stress us out more no so that's the what's what's interesting is there there's been there's been some assumptions i think some people have made that we have uh that, that we have a a monetization strategy in place like this is something that we're gonna make this and then it's gonna make us a gajillion dollars and i uh i i, I can't stress enough i wanted to w make this to have it made so the thing for me, and it's, and Jay said this a lot, it's the, he does, he, even if it's not him who makes it, he wants to watch this, right? And for me, what I want to do is I feel like there are a lot of people who would enjoy Cradle if it were in a format they really enjoyed, because there's a lot of people who don't want to read, you see a 12 book series and they, they, they don't want to settle in for that, right? It's, it's kind of like how, you know, the recent One Piece live action adaptation, the original author of the manga, was saying he's he's been saying for years he wanted it in live action and the reason is because there are people who will never watch anime and will never read the manga but would really enjoy the story of one piece and that's kind of how i feel uh is that everybody should enjoy one piece and then to a lesser degree they i think they would might enjoy cradle uh <laughs> don't undersell yourself here <laughs> <laughs> yeah but it's, it seriously is one of those things where I, i'm going i think uh i i think there's a lot of people out there who would enjoy the story of cradle but wouldn't necessarily want to read a bunch of novels. And if we could get it in this format, I think they would enjoy the story. So that's really my, my goal here. So if we have, if we end up with an animatic, might we end up finding someone who will fully animate it and then maybe potentially be interested in the second one, right? Maybe that's, that's a possibility. I, I, but is that a plan? Is that a strategy? Was that ever part of our strategy? Not really. Okay. And so, Jay, or is there another side to this where you're about to go? And here's my angle, or is it no, you're yeah. just <laughs> me? <laughs> well, I mean, I think for me uh, as a fan, I mean, I want to see it all animated. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the thing, the problem is, is that um, you know, animation is is very expensive um, to start off with. Like, it, it, it's different. There's a certain point in in a dollar amount where live action is infinitely cheaper than live action, right? Uh, but for animation, because you're dealing with, you know, hundreds of artists, you know, and everything has to be designed, everything has to be drawn. Um, it, it, it can be a little tedious and it may seem like, oh, you know, what? it costs a lot of money to make this. The thing is with animation, the, the business of it is the more episodes you make, the more that the episodes cost less, it gets amortized. So the, mm -hmm. the, the, so if you did just one episode, it's very expensive. If you did 10 episodes, each of those episodes come down quite a bit significantly because you're 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 doing them in mass. It's like going to Costco and buying it in bulk, right? Mm -hmm. um, because we're doing this, you know, the Animac is really just the the first thing that we're we're hoping that will hit. Because I'm hoping that we hit the later goals, like if we do the either yeah. the, the animated shorts or we get to the movies or the individual episodes. Um, and like what Will was saying is like we didn't really have a plan in terms of like oh we're gonna take this and go sell it to Netflix. You know, here's the thing if if the fans show up and they want to say, hey, listen, we want to pay for content that we want and the content will come directly to us and we don't have to pay a subscription to any of these streamers, then this is the best way to do it, right? Because you're paying you're paying the, the creators to make this and we're giving it directly to you, right? We're giving you the product. Uh, of course, you know, it still takes about a year, year and a half for, you know, for these things to get made. So it doesn't come fast, but you know, uh, both Will and I, you know, we're professionals. I've been doing this for almost 30 years now. Uh, and Will's been writing for a very long time too. Uh, we'll get it done. And also the series is done. It's not like we have to wait for Will to write the next book and it's been like eight years for him to write the next book. So in, in this kind of way, we already know what, what each book uh, entails in order to get it done. 
just a matter of like, okay, well, what is the plan for the fans? Like, if the, if we can make this work, and let's say we make this as an animated movie or uh, you know a series, you know, then we can just keep doing that every year. So, hey, who wants to see the next season? Oh, I'd love to pay for. I love to pay for another season of Cowboy Bebop, right? Even though the series technically ended, but I'd love to have more episodes that fit in there. I would totally have just kickstarted that because I would have loved to have seen more of these characters that I know and I love. And I think that's something that I I really uh, love about this project is that this is a way for fans who finish the series and is like, man, I really miss that world and I miss these characters. And I miss the nostalgia of of being. Uh, in in there with you know with Ethan and and Lyndon and and Yaren, and seeing it and being able to share it with my friends who don't read books and who will still you know this message of the story will still resonate with them mm -hmm. and I think this is the way to kind of like take control of that right I mentioned yeah. this before where this is kind of like like we're doing like image comics ways or we're we're breaking yeah. up the, the industry. Uh, and doing it ourselves as opposed to having going through a streaming service or a big studio because like I mentioned earlier with those with those going that way there's going to be a lot of notes there's a lot then there's no guarantee you might even just get one season and then never renew it mm -hmm. where in this way we can do it hey listen if the fans want it and they pay for it we can keep making this and we can finish the whole series if they want it right and and we want that to happen but at the same time you know it's one of those things where uh, you know Will's on to his other books uh, but it'd be something that you know we'd love to kind of revisit. I'd love to work on it because you know, for me as as a as, as a director, there's so much um, to be said, and that I want to kind of fill in what Will has kind of already wrote, written, but at the same time, kind of give my kind of take on it. And and to me, that's super exciting. Yeah, and that's one of the things that I uh, that I've really enjoyed about this is I like having someone else's vision out there to f filling in what I what I have. I don't want it to just be my vision. It's way better to have it be the vision of more than one person. So that's been really cool. And then in terms of our, our strategy, it really is, I wanna work on this, Jay wants to work on this. This is something we're gonna be doing as much as we're allowed to. And that is kind of our, we're very much taking it one step at a time. Yeah, that's, it makes sense. It's, it's a very uh, flexible strategy approach. Yeah. And in terms of the uh, reaction you've gotten so far from fans, I mean, have your expectations been met? Are you looking to try and like, you know, blow out to even outside Cradle fans? Like how has the uh, launch of the Kickstarter been going so far? Well, what we hope is that uh, it will catch on to outside Cradle fans. So this mm -hmm. would, would be neat. Um, but it's, it was hard to have expectations about this. And this was one of the things we talked about uh, before we were going into the to the Kickstarter. And that's another thing, that, another factor that went into what goals do we set, right? We really didn't know what to expect. So we knew the higher goals are, are like, that's, that's way too ambitious. Mm -hmm. But the lower goals, are we gonna, do we think we're gonna end up with 1 million, 3 million, 5 million? Um, those are all a lot. That's all a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And we're going now, how much do of that do we think we can really get? We weren't sure. And so that was a big part of the conversation that went into this is we were going, the more money we get, the better we can do this project. The more of the pro the more of the series we can do, the we can hire more artists. We just just we can do everything the more the more budget we have. But it was very hard to plan for. And that's one of the reasons why each stretch goal is so very different because we're going we want to do the maximum possible that we can at, at each at each buzz budget level because we didn't know what to plan on so the launch of the kickstarter is really as has it been with our expectations i mean obviously it would have been awesome had we gotten you know 20 million dollars day one right <laughs> but we didn't, nobody expected that so it's 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 one of those things where we knew we didn't know what to expect and we're really going, hey, whatever we end up with, we are committed to doing the best we can and making the best project we can with the budget we have. And finally, Jay, if you don't mind, I am fascinated. You said you, you have this company, you have your team. Can you tell us a little bit as fans about the team? I would love okay. to know the people who are gonna be hands on this project, uh, working to bring Cradle to life. I mean, we've, we've been able to meet you, which is amazing. But who's your team? Well, you know, it's funny is that uh, I started the studio because uh, one of the streaming services came to me and say, "Hey, well, I have the show that you know we'd like you to show run." And Wait, I, said, I got I to gotta stop you. What's oh, the name right. of your studio? Lex and Otis. Ah. There's a whole story behind that, but I'll I'll, I'll tell it another way. But okay. uh, but anyways, um, they asked me, well, you know, do you want to do this at one of the places around town, like Bento Box or Titmouse, one of the kind of independent studios? And I said, well, listen, like 
I know all the best people who've worked on every single show over the last, like I said, almost 30 years. How about this? I'll just hire all the best people and I'll just make a, I'll just make a studio. And then they said, okay. And I said, have you done this before? They're like, no, you're the first one. So I said, okay. So I, I, you know, I called up all my buddies around town who are the best at what they do. And, you know, uh, and I put together the team. I, I did basically like the image comics thing where I, I hired all the best, uh, you know, uh, directors and storyboard artists and designers and character designers and art directors and background painters and designers. I put them all together and, you know, I made the studio and, you know, we've been uh, fairly successful over the last couple of years. We worked on quite a few shows. Um, and uh, it's one of those things where, you know what you'll see is quality like you know, that's the one thing is like i wanted to have the good thing about this is that the reason why i wanted to start my own studio was also because i wanted to be a part of the scheduling of the budgets and i wanted to make sure i make i wanted to make a studio that i wanted to work at right uh, over the years i've worked on every single almost every single studio around town and there's always been that dream of like hey we all want to work at pixar we want to do this or disney and then I find out that working at those studios is just, you know, the same as working at some of the other studios. And, and you know, you are just a number. You're, you're there until they get rid of you. And so I always wanted to work on something where I felt like I was valued and that I, the, the designs, the writing, everything in the studio, everything being done for a particular production or project was at the top notch. Because again, at this point in my career, I don't want to waste my time working on something that I, I just do for, you know, just for a paycheck, right? So I made a studio where I wanted the artists to feel like they they matter, right? And so, you know, because I own the studio, I can I have say in what the budgets are, what the scheduling is like. So if it doesn't look good or if there, you know, if it looks like it's gonna be too much for my artists, I, I don't take the job, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes if like let's say um, something isn't up to the quality that I want, then that's okay because I step in and I kind of help out as much as I can. Because for me, I feel like, you know. Uh, the end product is what it's going to be, and I want to make sure that that uh, it, it's a good representation of everybody's work because, again, we're all putting our name on it. And at the same time, like I want something that I wanted to have a studio where everybody felt like they belong and they, that they're valued, and that's the reason why projects like this is something that is is kind of like for us. It's uh, it's a love letter to what we always wanted to work on, right? It's a project that, you know, uh, over the years, we never get a chance to because most of the time the studio just tells us, here's the budget, here's the time you have, and and here's the script, right? And usually one of those three or two of those three aren't optimal and you have to kind of make do with what you've got. But in this case, you know, again, if we can get the budget and we already have the, the, the writing and we've got the talent behind it, you know, this could be something very special. Well, thank you guys so much for being willing to show up and talk about this and the, the nitty gritty of the business of it. It's really fascinating from a fan's perspective, seeing this new alternative, exciting way to try and get an adaptation done. Something that wouldn't even be dreamed of 15 years ago is now uh, you're one of the people paving the road for others to go down after. So congratulations and whatever you're, you know, pitch the, the Kickstarter if you want, floor is yours, go ham. Oh yeah. Okay. So the Kickstarter is still going. Uh, it is for the next I don't know, two weeks. I think it's until February 8th. I think it's some ninth, ninth, February 9th says the disembodied voice till February 9th, 2024, the Kickstarter is going and we're really excited to bring you whatever we can. If you're at all interested, check it out. Links are on screen. And of course, in the description down below. Thank you again, Will and Jay for being willing to show up and talk to my goofy. Thanks butt. for having us. Of course, like and subscribe y'all. If you have not already check out the Kickstarter, I highly encourage you to do so. This is very exciting and have a good one y'all. Goodbye.